my name is Carolyn Wyborny. Um, I am an Ethernet device driver developer at Intel Corporation. I've been doing uh, device drivers, Ethernet device drivers, uh, for probably about 15 years or so. Um, I'm here today to talk about security uh, and SRIOV and what is our responsibility in the kernel. Uh, us device vendor people have been working uh, down uh, in the SRIOV space with uh, uh, this feature for several years. Um, but I know that everyone isn't uh, familiar with this feature uh, in a lot of detail, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining uh, explaining it. SRIOV uh, stands for Single Root IOV Virtualization. Uh, this is a PCI uh, SIG standard. Uh, and there's a specification for it. It has been uh, in existence probably for about 12 years now. Um, we've had several product lines with this feature. Uh, it was defined uh, back in the day, the need uh, was to have better performance and isolation uh, for networking devices in VMs. Uh, virtualization was uh, a lot newer back then. Um, and the idea was to have a, a way to divide up uh, the ethernet device uh, so that you could have a, a sub function uh, that you could assign uh, to an actual virtual machine. Um, so this is uh, known as a virtual function. Uh, there's actually a PCI config space for it. Uh, the operating system sees it as a hardware device. Um, and this can be assigned into the VM where it gets a virtual, uh, its own driver in the kernel space of the VM, which is called uh, the virtual function driver or VF driver. Uh, this driver then communicates with the physical function driver, uh, which still exists in the, in the kernel. Uh, and that's called the, the PF driver. This uh, feature uh, initially was uh, designed around performance. Um, it was a way to get traffic from the VM out, uh, out of the system as fast as possible uh, so that uh, hosted businesses and things uh, wouldn't have any uh, big slowdown in a, in a virtualized environment. Uh, that type of traffic from the VM uh, out to the, the system is called north-south traffic. Um, and this, this feature works very well for that. Um, there's been improvements over time. Um, However, east-west traffic, uh, which would be uh, traffic from a VM to another VM on the same system, uh, isn't, isn't quite as performant because by the nature of this uh, feature, the traffic has to go actually out of the system before it comes back into the system to the other VM. Uh, there's a lot of work happening still in this area, uh, but performance is not uh, why I'm here today. I'm here to talk about uh, security and port isolation. Uh, SRIOV also uh, was intended to be a, a secure way uh, to configure hardware features. And uh, the security was added by having the physical function driver, the PF driver in the kernel, uh, uh, handle requests for actually configuring uh, the device. The VF actually does have direct hardware access for a very limited set of resources. It has uh, some registers and some queues and it's allowed to configure those. Uh, anything beyond that typically uh, is done by a request to the PF driver um, or uh, to the firmware. Uh, and firmware, uh, as you may or may not know, is uh, software that lives actually on the device. It's not in the operating system uh, like the PF driver, it's on the actual device. Um, but using SRIOV um, as a way to configure VFs uh, provides more security uh, than drivers that are completely in user space. Uh, the isolation and, uh, and security model of your traditional e-commerce business uh, is probably obvious to most. Uh, it is uh, complete isolation. The uh, traffic from one business on one VF, potentially on the same device, um, would not have any access or be able to interfere in any way with um, another VF on the same device, potentially, or on the same system um, in another business. This is a, a, a base uh, requirement. Uh, this is not a nice to have feature. This is what uh, our cloud service providers are selling to users. And this is what we as a device vendor um, are expected to provide um, in their environment. Uh, this was uh, a lot easier to do uh, a few years ago where parts were often uh, architected by hardware to be completely isolated. The ports were completely isolated in silicon. Um, as manufacturing costs and uh, other pressure, size, um, all of these things have come to bear over the years and uh, networking 
Ethernet networking devices now often um, have some element of shared resources um, and the management of those um, and the isolation then expected um, has been passed, that responsibility has been passed uh, to uh, either the firmware um, right, or the, or the PF driver. Also, uh, since, uh, since the traditional e-commerce and virtualization world, uh, we have had uh, a lot of changes in the telecom space. Um, those of you that may be familiar with the telecom world is that uh, this used to be large data centers full of purpose-built uh, platforms, purpose-built hardware uh, with purpose-built software. Um, it was all very expensive. Um, it was all very specialized. Um, and those of us in the regular uh, PC e-commerce uh, world uh, weren't exposed to, uh, to use cases uh, from, that, from that environment. Uh, relatively recently, uh, that industry has converted to uh, PC uh, platforms. Um, they're still customized quite a bit, but it's a regular PC platform um, with uh, the operating systems there. Um, with that, um, we have been exposed uh, to the packet processing model. Uh, network processing, uh, network processors uh, was uh, what it was back in the day. Um, and now uh, that's sort of a different world. That's not, uh, that's not a business where you have maybe have a data a database back end to a web server. Um, what you have here is pure bulk packet processing. Um, there is nothing else happening on these systems but packet processing. Um, so isolation and, and security, you have control of the data center, you have control of your packet processing. Um, that model uh, wasn't as important to this, uh, to this kind of user. Um, however, the data centers and virtualization as a feature, um, which is basically taking over all of the computing world, um, has uh, evolved and now um, there are data centers uh, that will host multiple telecom uh, tenants. And so now, now we're back to needing to isolate again uh, somewhat. Now, these differing uh, models and differing requirements uh, make it difficult for a device vendor to provide a generic product that supports uh, all those use cases. And some use cases are diametrically opposed uh, to the others. Uh, the uh, traditional model of the of the VF is that it's in the the, the world out there. It's in a uh, it's in a completely untrusted uh, user space. Uh, anyone could potentially get access to it, uh, potentially provide any modify a driver, um, do something that would be unexpected um, from the device vendor perspective. We would protect against that. Uh, it's done very simply in that not letting them do very much. Um, you would lock down uh, that type of VF so that it, it can't cause trouble. Um, this is the safest model. This is the traditional e-commerce uh, model. Um, however, uh, often with uh, comms uh, use cases, uh, we have provided um, as vendors new uh, and uh, uh, fancy hero features, maybe we would call them, um, that we want to sell. Um, to users. So as we define those features, and uh, those features might have some uh, capability that would be sensitive in a traditional VF world, uh, we find that users are asking for exactly those features uh, in a VF as they continue to virtualize their entire uh, user space, or excuse me, their entire uh, business. Uh, they would want some of these features uh, in, in a VF. Um, the way to do that today uh, in the Linux kernel is with uh, the IP route tool set. Uh, there is in the IP link, um, there is a set VF trust. Um, and that, that allows an admin uh, to say that a VF is trusted so that it could do something um, maybe that a, a regular uh, default VF could not. Um, this is an all or nothing option. Uh, it is one, uh, one setting and it's up to the vendors. Uh, typically at this point to decide uh, what might be uh, something that needs to uh, have this setting um, to give this privilege. I'd like to, to say using the word trust is a bit uh, of a misnomer here. Uh, this doesn't truly make this VF uh, trustworthy uh, in, the, in the traditional security sense. All that it really does is give, uh, it targets or, or, or defines a VF as getting extra privileges. It's allowed to configure some features um, that um, a, a regular traditional a VF might, uh, might not need or might maybe shouldn't have, um, depending on the environment. Um, I believe and we believe uh, that users should define uh, this policy, uh, the policy of what features uh, get added to what VF. This shouldn't be up to the device vendors. Let's take a look at uh, 
what some of these privileges might look like and how they might apply. Um, I've got a couple of different roles here that you might uh, assign to a VF uh, in, your, in your data center. Um, I've got some features. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, filtering. You might have some uh, custom protocols. You might have some unique things um, that you would want a special, uh, special access to. Um, so maybe you would want uh, that particular kind of role to have uh, that kind of extra privilege. Promiscuous mode is, is probably where the trust uh, idea came from in the first place, um, because uh, you wouldn't want a regular untrusted VF to have access to all of the packet traffic on a device. Um, but if you were gonna make a, a VF as a firewall, you would want it to have um, access to that traffic to do its job. Um, you also could have, if you're gonna define an access control or some sort of TCAM configuration, uh, that feature might be something uh, that a, a filtering type VF would need access to. Uh, but you may or may not want your firewall to have that same, uh, same privilege. Uh, this new use case with uh, VFs configuring other VFs, uh, that, that's a use case that's come out of the telecom world where the tenant has just a set of VFs. They don't have access to any device um, and the, uh, the tenant, uh, the, the host provider of the data center is not providing any configuration either. Uh, it is up to the tenant to totally configure their environment. Um, so in that case, you may want uh, that VF to be able to do some things on, on behalf of other VFs, uh, but you probably uh, still wouldn't want it to be uh, configuring uh, promiscuous mode. Uh, the other problem that we have today, um, or I would say maybe challenge is a better word, is that this is potentially handled. All of these different defining a feature as sensitive and, and or not um, is handled differently by all uh, the device vendors today. We've had uh, additional requests from users for other features that uh, with SRIOV being in existence for so long that um, were never contemplated as um, features that, that VFs would want. Um, but again, as virtualization has transformed the data center, um, you, we get requests for these kinds of things, whether a VF should be able to change their MAC address uh, or their VLAN configuration. Um, spoof check uh, is, a, is a security feature in a VF. Um, uh, there have been use cases provided where, uh, where users want to disable this for some reason. Um, these kinds of things would be considered sensitive features in addition to the ones that I've already presented. Um, if we had a generic list of defines, because I believe that this challenge is, uh, is met by all of the device vendors in very similar ways, if we had a generic set of defines that we could use um, and that users could combine in a way, it would be uh, consistent and flexible for users. If we manage it in the kernel, then it's more generic for everyone. So my proposal is that we define a feature, we define uh, the privileges in a more granular manner uh, with a set of trust flags. Um, we can use them as a bit field uh, and uh, the, we would extend uh, the VF devices would uh, define, uh, tell the kernel, communicate with the kernel that they can support uh, this feature. We can extend this interface. Um, there are not user space changes required for this. Um, and you could still retain the original all or nothing um, bucket type approach if that's what works uh, for your environment and, and, and maybe it does. Um, but it would allow the VF trust model to be more flexible uh, for users. Here's a list of flags, uh, a base set of flags uh, that I came up with. I'm sure that this is not uh, uh, the final list, but what I would like to do with this list is to start the discussion with the other device vendors on uh, what sort of base privileges would we need. Um, let's take a look at what we have uh, so far. Advanced flow would be about filtering uh, that uh, is expecting traffic or, or wanting to catch traffic that is uh, external to the VF is uh, what the VF would not normally have access to. Uh, mirroring, we talked about that briefly. Mirroring is every packet, um, you know, it's, it's an infrastructure monitoring uh, uh, capability. Uh, you wouldn't want just uh, particularly any old VF that's trusted to maybe have this feature. Uh, there, we have three modes of promiscuous defined. Um, there are several layers of it. Um, I think between the three or maybe some, some combination of that, we could manage uh, what what users actually want for being able to configure promiscuous uh, mode in a VF. Uh, MAC address change, MTU change is a new one. Um, 
but uh, at least new to uh, the SRIOV world. Uh, I don't know that you want VFs uh, to change MTU. Uh, at least we thought they never would want to change MTU. Uh, that has changed again currently. Uh, we do have users asking for the ability to make MTU changes uh, in a VF. The spoof check disable flags. Uh, we have two levels of uh, spoof check. Uh, so, um, but I'm sure that I'm missing something. What else? Um, let's start the discussion. Maybe we need RSS configuration. Maybe we need some other things in here. The design of this feature, uh, just generally, uh, we would be extending the, the get, get VF config callback in the kernel um, to uh, allow a trust flag configuration. We would uh, do the define, uh, discuss and agree on the generic set of defines in the kernel to have. Um, we would also add validation of some set of generic flags uh, configured in the kernel. Uh, and, uh, and we would also change the IP route to tool set to allow uh, this configuration via that tool set. Just to provide a little more detail, um, we would be adding uh, an, uh, the IFLA trust flags struct It'll be a new struct. Um, it looks just like IFLA trust. Um, the IFLA VF info uh, would also get an additional member uh, for trust flags capability. Um, in the drivers, uh, minimally, all that needs to change for compilation and for nothing generally to change is to uh, change uh, one of the parameters to the callback NDO set VF trust. Um, that would need to be changed uh, to a U32. It's uh, to actually configure the trust flags, um, uh, the, the response to get VF config info is the IFLA VF info struct. Um, and if you configure trust flags in your response, instead in, at init, instead of trusted, uh, you would then get uh, the kernel uh, expecting um, a flag value. And, and zero or one is an option there as well, which is all that we have today. Um, if you don't change it, uh, you still would have the original uh, all or nothing configuration. And, and then an IP link, we would um, allow uh, change the user interface to allow a, uh, a hex value in addition to the strings today uh, that we have for on or off. So for follow-up, by the time this presentation airs, the patches will have been submitted uh, to the kernel. Uh, They're submitted RFC so that we can discuss the generic flags. Um, I hope and encourage all of you to, to participate in the discussion in that so that we can get that resolved. And uh, um, that's all. Thank you for listening and we'll open it now for uh, Q&A. Um, I so, uh, okay, so there's a couple of questions, but I, I'll do my overarching question first and then we'll get to that. Um, so the, the high order bit seems to be that you're going to do trust enablement and then effectively create a direct relationship between the VM and the VF that it is, it is trying to manage. I, I had a very ra random basic question. Why isn't all the configuration state just a page that's mapped into the hypervisor? You try to change configuration take a fault into the hypervisor, and then the hypervisor has the ability to sort of resolve whether the VM has the access control it needs, whether the VF can support it. And you can actually do that through a PF even, right, at that point. Um, so, yeah, there is there is higher level uh, security type grouping and, and privileges, but uh, these things still to get actually configured in the device have to go through this, uh, uh, this interface. Think so. Okay, so you're 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 focusing on the very narrow, like I have to yes. tell the VF VF driver and I guess the IPC between the driver and the device to go yes. enable some things. Okay, got it. Uh, that answers my question completely. Uh, question from uh, Ah, could you clarify what no user space changes means? It seems like user space extension in the host is necessary to set the flags. Yes, so there, there's extensions and additions. Um, so I shouldn't have said no user space changes. What I meant is the user space ABI is not changed. Um, and we would convert the, the trust, the trusted setting today uh, to be the trust flags um, in an all or nothing mode for legacy. And, and that, that needs to be worked out a bit on the, on the implementation. Uh, so I, I expect some discussion and, and, uh, and interaction on that, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I see your point, go ahead. If you want to go Makes through the 
Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, well, most of the rest was amazing presentation, clear presentation, looks good, well articulated. Uh, none of them were questions. Um, I, I had a comment, which is, uh, yeah, I think RSS to the VM is absolutely required, even RFS and things like that. Yes. So basically anywhere where there is an NDO, the way I would say it is that anywhere where there's a driver NDO, potentially is something a VM will want to do to the VF itself, right? Because that's the kind of thing it, a particular VM might want and specifically things like RSS and RFS since it spans only the queues that were assigned to that VF. Yes, they can that makes sense. Those out, right? Yeah, we, uh -huh. we st I started with just a, a internal discussion on what are we getting asked for? What are the things that we get asked for? And and certainly I, I realize that it can be extended and, and that's, I just started with what we had and and absolutely we need to add more. Um, thank you, that's good, uh, that's good feedback, I'll take that. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's one more question I think um, about the existing trust flags. Uh, ah. Yes, um, that 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 would be the idea. Yep, I think that's it. Uh, any any questions? Any more comments? I, I have a question, Carmen. So, mm -hmm. uh, in regards to smart NICs, right? So I, I've heard of this trend where, and Shannon is saying something there, so he may be able. I was just reading up on Pensando yesterday for the first time. So Pensando apparently, or people like Pensando are doing a lot of attestation in the smart NIC as opposed to trusting what's going to the host. Is this another way to solve the same problem or? Um, I'm not sure exactly of how that's working with Pensando. So um, no, I, I mean, I know the, the smart NICs in general, if you can you do right. some of these features by adding the trust uh, control in the smart NIC as opposed to exposing, uh, you know, VFs unchanged. Uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, I think the trust concept itself needs to be addressed in SmartNICs in some way. Um, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm not sure of the Pensando implementation exactly, um, but uh, it, it, yes. I mean, I, the answer to the, the answer to the question is yes. This is specifically proposed for SRIOV, um, and I'm not sure how SRIOV fits exactly into SmartNICs. Um, I know SIOV. There's other there's other technologies coming in the future. Um, I think the trust question and the privilege question is going to have to be answered for any of them, whether it's specific to SRIOV or not. It, 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 that's right. So I think, I, I think Jamal, the answer to your question is that SRIOV is the front end, right? It doesn't matter, matter whether it's a smart NIC or a slightly smart NIC or a dumb NIC. The, the point here is that, like, let's say, talk about promiscuous mode. In a smart NIC, you could say, turn it on, and the smart NIC might decide to not turn it on for you. This is the only way you get to find out that that's what happened. Right. Yeah, I also um, think it would be worth to uh, add those features to the dev link with port representers, right? Not only the IP. Yeah, that, that makes sense too. Useful yeah. in, for a smart thing. Yeah, sense. yep. Um, and there's another question from, yeah, so there it... are more questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, is there a public discussion? Um, there can be. I, I submitted patches yesterday for RFC, um, and uh, I guess I'm not sure exactly how to uh, enable a public discussion in another way. But um, we, yes, we can do that. Uh, and uh, how does a Shannon has? How does a config VF use this on other VFs? Um, yeah, that has to be enabled in the device. Um, the idea would be that um, the special config VF would have a privilege just for that, and you wouldn't have that in other VFs. This is uh, there's certain telcos that have this uh, sort of configuration model, and I think it's supported today in some out of tree drivers. Um, so, thanks, Jake, for posting the link to the patch. Patches, I just sent a couple. It was a it's a RFC just to discuss the initial defines and a, just a, an example implementation. There's some a lot of it that's not detailed yet, um, and I of course plan to do all that um, in the full set. Register space question. there. Yeah, so uh, in SRIOV, a limited set of register spaces do get replicated for a VF. So uh, a, yeah, an SRIOV VF driver does have access to some registers, the registers that are allocated to it. But that's a design choice. Right? SRIOV yeah. doesn't actually yeah. di dictate anything about register replication, and that's up to your device and your so the question, Yeah, and the question about RSS would be about whether you can configure it in your uh, as a VF or not, not whether you have it or not. You definitely have it. It's just whether you could change the configuration of it. Yeah, for example, some of our hardware has RSS that where the 
like the older hardware always had RSS exposed and newer hardware has it as something you have to communicate with, with the PF to yeah. do. So that's changed. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Carla.